says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. May God bless you, and I hope this is a great day for you with Christ. Welcome to Today with Christ. I'm Don Smith here at the Radio Bible Hour with my friend Scott Ingram. And uh, Scott and I are going to continue today a discussion on the issue of some concerns that one of the great 20th century Christians Francis Schaeffer had Mm -hmm. toward the end of his life about what he was seeing in the world uh, in terms of the direction of the church and uh, how Christianity was going and some of the difficulties that he was Mm -hmm. seeing. And today we're going to focus on one of those 10 points that he mentioned. Today we're going to focus on the ecumenical movement, Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, cooperative movement. What is meant, Scott, by ecumenism? or ecumenicism, uh, Mm -hmm. however it goes, or the ecumenical movement? Well, ecumenism is a a $5 word, isn't it? Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's one of those words that everybody doesn't exactly know. Um, But ecumenism, according to the dictionary, is the movement or the tendency toward worldwide Christian unity or cooperation. All that sounds good, doesn't Mm -hmm. it? For all Christianity to cooperate together. And uh, the ecumenical movement is something that's come along uh, here in the last hundred years or so that has really tried to bring everybody, all the churches together into one group. Uh, There's an ideal in the Catholic Church about bringing the Protestants back in. There is uh, a group called the World Council of Churches that want to have brought several in, said they would welcome the Catholic Church if that was possible. And uh, they have the Orthodox churches and Protestant churches gathering together. And that sounds like a very good thing to bring churches together. As a matter of fact, the scripture even says uh, in Psalm 133, 1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And Jesus himself in John 17, 22 said, And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So Jesus prayed for uh, the church to come together. I think the big question, though, is, when it speaks here about uh, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together, who are our brethren? Well, that's a good point, and, and a lot of it hangs on on that. Going back into the 1950s, some of the earliest sermons uh, that I can remember my dad preaching when I was mm-hmm. a little boy, uh, he really strongly uh, attacked the World Council of Churches, the mm-hmm. National Council of Churches of Christ in America, because he felt that they were uh, really ignoring fundamental beliefs that were core uh, to Christianity. And they mm-hmm. were starting to focus, and their their purposes always seemed to align somehow with the international Marxist movement, uh, hmm. the communist movement at, at that time in the 50s and 60s. And uh, sure enough, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 89, a lot of information came out uh, through the Bulgarian Secret Service. The mm-hmm. World Council of Churches had been infiltrated and influenced uh, through what's called liberation theology in the Catholic uh, Church uh, at that time to oppose uh, the United States and to uh, <laughs> and to support the interest of Soviet Union around the world at that time. Oh, wow. And so it made me think how prophetic my dad's sermons were back in the in the late forties and early fifties when he was seeing this and calling it out and people kind of laughed about that and said, No, you know, this is really a good thing. Churches mm-hmm. should be working together. But like you're saying, Scott, it really comes down to uh, Jesus wanted us to be one with those who are our brothers and sisters in him. Yeah, that's and, it. And who did he call his followers? Well, he, he didn't just say it was people who had a pro, uh, pro-life pro stance, did, they? did he? 
He didn't say that that our brothers are only those people who hold a traditional view of the family. He didn't say they were all those who were helping the homeless and the sick. And he didn't say it was just those who desired to see justice in the world. Mm -hmm. And Uh, the Pharisees, for example, whom he attacked often, Mm -hmm. were really in line in terms of the ethics and the politics and all that that sort of thing. But Jesus found fault with them. Mm -hmm. He did. Uh, And like you were speaking about this World Council of Churches, if you go on there their website today, you'll not hear anything about communism. Uh, you'll not hear anything about any of these things. As a matter of fact, it says on their website, uh, the World Council of Churches is a fellowship of churches which confess the Lord Jesus Christ as God and Savior according to the Scriptures and, and therefore seek to fulfill together their common calling to the glory of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That all sounds good. What they don't tell you right up front on the front page of the website is that they ordain women. They are are in favor of ordaining homosexuals. Not only that, there was a conference uh, called the Reimagining Conference in 1993 uh, where one of their ladies, a, a lady named Mercy, she stood up and said that we all have spirit mothers that are are avenging us and that if we listen very closely we can hear our dead relatives in the rustling of the trees and the groaning of the woods in the crying grass and in the moaning rocks now that doesn't <laughs> sound like christianity another lady come up who said this uh, she said that salvation can be defined as bringing out what is within you. And then she quoted some things that were outside the Bible called the Gnostic Gospels. And when she was Which questioned... Which had been clearly yeah. defined by the church authorities for centuries mm-hmm. as heresy. Yeah, and here she is speaking from it. Opposed to the basic Christian principles. Yeah. And, and it's interesting uh, to look at that. One of the things that I think every Christian uh, has to deal with is who will we work with and who Mm -hmm. will we uh, maybe decline uh, to work with? That does not mean that we, uh, nobody's good enough and that we're opposed to working with everybody. And uh, it's interesting to look at uh, some of the common ground that we find, Mm -hmm. but more importantly, it's interesting and important to look at the core beliefs that we can't compromise on. No, no. And there are certain things like, like this idea of, of the dead speaking to you and all these different things. This isn't in the Bible. Not only is it not in the Bible, communication with the dead is strongly forbidden in the Bible as something that you don't want to have anything to do with. Mm -hmm. And and you're sitting here at this World Council uh, conference and hear this lady speaking on this. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, if Mm -hmm. you have any biblical insight whatsoever, you should know it's wrong. And, And if you don't know what the Bible says then how can you know what sin is? How can you know uh, what is offensive to God? Mm -hmm. How can you know uh, if you're a sinner? If you don't know you're a sinner, how can you know how to be saved that you need to be saved? So uh, all of these things being glossed over for the sake of, you know, pushing the pro-life stance for uh, going forward and, and you know, uh, protecting maybe mm-hmm. in some sense the traditional family uh, and, or helping someone across the sea uh, to, to have a, a good Christmas or who knows what. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. All of these things are good things, mm-hmm. but the gospel is the main thing, isn't mm-hmm. it, Don? It is. And I've been on mission trips uh, uh, in various parts of the world in which uh, medical missions was done, in which people... People were fed or mm-hmm. uh, there was a flood relief or hurricane relief or uh, uh, after the earthquake in Haiti, for example. And we always looked at that as a way to spread the news, the good news of mm-hmm. the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we did those things primarily for the purpose of telling people about the saving power of Jesus Christ and uh, to share the share the gospel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we cooperated or worked with many groups that were not interested in sharing the gospel. Yeah. And I got to see the difference mm-hmm. between those groups that were really committed to Jesus Christ and what they were doing was spiritual work there and those groups that were doing humanitarian work. Big difference. Uh, and uh, yeah, and one of the 
temptations, I think, Scott, is that if you are doing work that's humanitarian, if you're feeding people or you're doing uh, flood relief or, or disaster relief, people are going to give you lots of pats on the back. Going to get your picture in the local newspaper. Good and people are going to say, <laughs> what a great guy you are for doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing what Jesus Christ was doing and telling people primarily about their need for forgiveness of sin, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that they need to come to God through Jesus Christ, that that is the only way mm -hmm. uh, to come to God, you're not going to get much good press no. these days. Mm -mm, no, and that's what Schaefer was warning of back uh, a long time ago in this book. Um, he even said, if the truth of the Christian faith is in fact truth, then it stands in antithesis to the ideas and immorality of our age. Mm -hmm. And it must be practiced both in teaching and practical action. Truth demands confrontation. It must be loving confrontation. But there must be confrontation nonetheless. You know, those little signs that you see on the back of cars that say, coexist. Well, I always look at that, and I think it would be great for someone to create one that said contradict. Because <laughs> every one of those different religions, they all contradict one another. One of them has to be the truth. And it's the same way uh, in, in Christian circles. Uh, there might be plenty of people out there that say, I'm Christian. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're Christian. A lot of this is based on what do you see sin as. And uh, your dad, Dr. J. Harold Smith, uh, he spoke pretty clearly about what sin was, didn't mm -hmm, he, Don? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that uh, he was seeing, and we're going to hear in this uh, video clip mm -hmm. uh, from one of his sermons, is that there are ways to distinguish between people who are preaching biblical truth mm -hmm. and uh, churches which are not. Yeah. And one of the distinctions is being specific yes. uh, about what you're preaching. You know, when I was working as a psychologist in uh, psychotherapy and so forth, one of the characteristics that marked good therapists mm -hmm. from bad ones is that good ones were able to be very concrete. Yeah. And they didn't Clear. leave things in the abstract. They didn't say, oh, you're having trouble uh, reaching your goals. They mm -hmm. said, you are not getting up in the morning mm -hmm. and going to work because you're staying up too late at night mm -hmm. uh, and fooling around. And here, very concretely, is where you're going wrong yeah. in these life strategies. The Makes church sense. should be doing that as well. Mm -hmm. And this is what my dad is talking about here, is being concrete in identifying sin mm -hmm. uh, very, very clearly in mm -hmm. the church. And when you do that, it separates you from all the other folks who are just mm -hmm. kind of, well, you know, uh -huh. let's, just, let's just all come together. Uh, the gospel is at stake. Uh, so let, let's have a look at that video. Do you realize that we are raising a generation of young people that have no conscience? They don't believe, they just soon kill you as they look at you. They have no conscience. Why? Because they've been in a school where it's against the law of our nation to have the Ten Commandments on the wall of the principal or the superintendent of that school. We are living in a nation where I tell you our homes are wrecked and divided and where our homes have drunken, drunkenness, where they enjoy, brother, I tell you, the world and the things of the world, where they'd far rather take their sons to a softball game than to take them to a prayer meeting, where they'd rather give their daughters dancing lessons and to teach them, brother, I tell you, the Ten Commandments. We are raising a generation that's going to hell. And I mean they're going to hell on a toboggan slide. And you are responsible. Preacher, if you don't stand up in that pulpit and declare the whole truth and preach sin as it is, one of these days when God, you stand before the judgment seat of Christ as one of his preachers, one of his shepherds, God is going to say to you, you're a disgrace to my kingdom. You are a disgrace to the wonderful bride of mine, the church of the living God. Brother preacher, you preach. You name sins. I remember one night when I'd preached a sermon and I'd named them. I'd talked about bridge, card playing, gambling, poker, seven up, blackjack, and whatever you have. I preach against casinos. 
I preach against having lotteries and playing the lottery, betting on ball games. I preach on the whole thing and I named it. And one lady came down and she said, you know the reason. You know the reason a lot of people don't support you on your television and on your radio programs. I said, no, ma'am. Why? I've wondered. She said, you name sins. Why don't you just say sin and not name them? That's the attitude of the average Southern Baptist today. Now, I don't know anything about independent. I know a lot about independent Baptist churches because I preach about a third of my time in them, but I know Southern Baptists. I don't know much about Methodists. I don't know much about the Church of God and the Pentecostals. I don't know much about the Catholic Church and the Jewish synagogue. But I want to tell you something. In our Baptist churches, preachers, we have eased up on the matter of sin. And no longer do we speak and preach on the exceeding sinfulness of sin. And no longer do we preach on the almighty greatness of our God. We need to come back and preach that Jesus Christ was God manifested in the flesh. That word manifest means reveal in the flesh. Jesus himself said, He that has seen the Father has seen me. I and the Father are two. No, he didn't say that. I and the Father are one. One. It is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All of them co-equal. All of them forming the almighty God. The one that said I am. The one that said I am the almighty God. The one that said I am the only God. Muhammad was not a God. and He was not a savior. He's dead in that tomb in Mecca. Confucius was not a God. He was an idol. He, he, he was a false prophet. All of these gods that men worship today are false gods. There is but one God that can hear your prayer. There is but one God that can see your sin. There is but one God that can forgive you of your sin. There is but one God, I tell you, that can wash away all of your sins with his precious blood. Nothing else. No water. No works. No worship. None of that. Just the blood plus nothing. The Bible says that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it wonderful that you can know that all of your sins are forgiven? You're looking in the face of a preacher that knows that every sin that he ever committed, and I'm so ashamed of some of them, that I committed before I got saved, every sin that I've committed since I got saved, and every sin that I commit between here and heaven, they're under the blood. And the good part is, God don't remember them. Now you talk about the joy of His salvation, that's what it is. Now, the Bible says you have lost the joy, not of your salvation, but of His salvation. Have you ever wondered why you're not a happy Christian? Have you ever wondered why it is that you doubt and fear and live in misery and afraid to die, I'll tell you, I'll tell you it's this. You have, not to, you have not come to the place where you realize that every sin that you ever committed before, now, and in the future is under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and gone forever. Isn't that wonderful? You say, I've never thought of that preacher. Well, that's the truth. That's a great example of old-fashioned preaching mm-hmm. that we don't hear much anymore in our we churches should, today. <laughs> and Dad is talking about, in the first part of that video, he is doing what he was talking about. He's naming sin. He talked he about does. gambling. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fifty years ago, that would not have been controversial. Mm-hmm. But in a day in which our governments now endorse mm-hmm. and support and prosper on the basis of the sin of gambling, yeah. Uh, we live in a very, very different world. Why is it important uh, to speak about sin and to name sin specifically? It's because 
salvation begins with the conviction that we are sinners. We yes. come to recognize our eyes are opened. Mm-hmm. Uh, we say, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm not wonderful. In fact, I am a sinner mm-hmm. and I'm not getting better. Yeah. My own effort is not working. Mm-hmm. And unless preachers do that, unless we hear that in our churches, where else will we hear that oh, absolutely. today? Absolutely. And, you know, the Bible says it doesn't say that the angels rejoice in heaven uh, because we dug a well. It doesn't say the angels rejoice in heaven because we made a new law. It says the angels rejoice in heaven because one sinner repented and turned to Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that is what the church is to be about. And if mm-hmm. we don't know what sin is, it, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, start? Yeah. Yeah. and I yeah. go to these websites nowadays mm-hmm. and, and there's this idea of well, what do you believe? I always go there when I go to a Christian website mm-hmm. to see what it says. And a lot of them are just this copy and paste thing that's very vague. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do they believe about Jesus being God? What do they believe about, uh, you know, what sin is? Uh, do, do they Are they very clear about this is wicked and this is not? They're not anymore, are they? I was thinking about our YouTube videos that we have on line uh, one particular we put out recently uh, said jesus is god and you know I, I spread this out on the internet and that caused such a stir to say you can't just say jesus is god mm-hmm. you know how why would you say something like mm-hmm. that you know and that's not no. foreign to the bible no. is it Don? That, that is the basic fundamental tenet of Christianity. Absolutely. If you do not believe that Jesus is divine, that he is God, and that he is uniquely mm-hmm. God, not a, that we're all gods or mm-hmm. something, some watered down version of it, but, but just very concretely, if you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, why do you call yourself a Christian? Yeah. Because that is can the fundamental point yeah. of Christianity. Yeah. What, yeah. Can, what can he do? If he's not God, if he wasn't sinless when mm-hmm. he died on that cross, he couldn't pay the price for your sin. And, and so we see a lot of confusion in the world today. We see a lot of um, hindrance uh, of that message. But we should expect that in mm-hmm. a world that is sinful. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not in our home right now, are we, Don? No, it's right. <laughs> and, you know, Scott, it may be interesting to maybe take a look just for a few minutes mm-hmm. at some of those core beliefs again. And we've mentioned them on this program. I don't think we can mention mm-hmm. them too often. No, it's true. Uh, but there's certain principles that we cannot give up mm-hmm. as Christians because Jesus said that if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. Yes, uh, serious and, words. And that is, that is a consequence uh, that is, to me, is very frightening uh, for a lot of people. Many people are tempted literally to deny Christ uh, when they are doing good works. Yeah. They want the glory Isn't for themselves something? or they're embarrassed mm-hmm. uh, uh, by the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, they're tempted. So one of the things that we uh, feel is really important if we're looking at cooperating with other groups or churches or even individuals is how do they feel about Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. Is he the unique son of God? Uh, Is he divine? Is he God, the the one person of the three-part trinity, uh, Mm -hmm. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Do they agree with us Mm -hmm. on that point? Very important. Another one is on the nature of scripture. Mm -hmm. And we've in this 500th year of the the uh, Reformation, we've talked about the sola scriptura, yeah. the the fact that the Bible is sufficient uh, mm-hmm. to answer questions of doctrine. It is the place where God speaks to us consistently mm-hmm. and reliably. It is God's message to us. It is his truth. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it is unique in that way. And we have to guard that, too. As right. a matter of fact, our, our next episode will speak to the inerrancy of the scriptures. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, something that is another thing that people are just casting aside. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't matter what, the, what you write it into or how mm-hmm. you want to make it into, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's one of those things that is a core doctrine. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Another of those is about the nature of the human being. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is our fundamental nature? Now, in the New Age movement, we're told that all of us are gods, little gods perhaps, mm-hmm. uh, evolving towards some uh, greatness, some equality uh, uh, with the great God. Uh, Christianity and its fundamental doctrine says that man 
mankind has fallen. Mm. He or she is sinful. Yes. Uh, that sinful nature is something that we are not capable of fixing mm-hmm. on our own. But that idea that there's good in everyone. Uh, when uh, the uh, uh, when Hindus say hello, that you'll often see them say namaste. They'll fold their mm-hmm. hands and say no. And that means uh, the divinity in me salutes and acknowledges the divinity in you. Mm. What they're talking about is that idea that there is divine or divinity in each one of us Mm -hmm. uh, and in every animal, perhaps, and Mm -hmm. plant and everything else. And everything uh, is God. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so so that clearly is something that's very different from what we believe about the nature of human beings. That's actually what Satan told us. You can be like God. That was the temptation, (laughs) wasn't it? Eat this fruit uh, that, you know, you think God has told you not mm-hmm. to eat that or forbidden that, but that's not really what yeah. he meant. Uh, and if you go ahead and eat it, you'll be like God. Mm-hmm. And that is the original temptation. That is the temptation of the New Age movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the temptation that we hear in some very large religious movements mm-hmm. uh, today as well. And finally, and this one uh, is a clear distinguisher, is there is one way to God. Mm-hmm. There is one way to salvation and that is through Jesus Christ. The way of salvation entails the repentance of sin, the acknowledgement that we are sinners, Mm -hmm. our our willingness to humble ourselves and repent and call on God for his help. Call on Jesus Christ uh, to be our Lord and And Savior. And none of those are a work that you do. It's just acknowledging and receiving a gift. Uh, You receive that gift. And that's the most important thing. If we aren't able to, to give out the gospel while we give out food, uh, while we uh, help out in government programs. If we aren't able to give out the gospel, then we've failed. Mm-hmm. We've just absolutely failed. There's no point in it. Some of the things of this nature, it's kind of sad. The Bible talks about a one-world religion at the end of time, a group that would the religions would all come together in one. Uh, and we kind of see that now, don't we, Don, in this this pushing aside of what we be- say we believe and what we, we don't say we believe, mm-hmm. you know, and, mm-hmm. and just going on good feelings and things. Uh, folks, you better get ready. Mm-hmm. Jesus is coming back one day. He's coming back to judge uh, those who are, are lost and, and to receive those who are saved. Where will you be on that day? It's the most important question you can ever ask yourself. And if you look at these things that Scott and I are talking about on uh, the nature of Jesus, mm-hmm. the nature of human beings, the truth of the scripture, the way of salvation, uh, and you ask this group or this church that you're thinking about working with in a mm-hmm. project or cooperating with or joining, uh, if they differ on those, uh, then you know that they are not aligned yes. uh, with what Jesus Christ tells us mm-hmm. uh, through scripture. So it's important for for us to work with the brethren, the, the, the brothers and sisters in Christ mm-hmm. are the ones that we want to align ourselves with, and we want to cooperate and work uh, hard uh, on spreading the gospel. Mm-hmm. We give that cup of cold water in That's Jesus' right. name, That's right. in his real name, not just uh, uh, this parade of ideas that say Jesus, but it's not really Jesus. Right. Well, thank you for being with us for the broadcast today and tune in again soon for another broadcast of Today with Christ. And our prayer for you today is that your relationship with Jesus Christ may be all that it can be. And this may be a great day for you with him. I'm Don Smith at the Radio Bible Hour, and I want to tell you about my father, J. Harold Smith's most powerful message. The message is God's Three Deadlines. We have it on DVD. Uh, We're making it available for a donation of $20, or you can receive it, uh, just the audio portion, on compact disc for a donation of $10. And thank you for watching.